It's Mother's Day, a time to celebrate all the wonderful mothers out there, not just for being shining examples of how great a mom can be, but also for being beautiful reflections of who God is. Like God, you've provided for us. You've shown us how much you care from the very beginning. With God, you've guided us, helping us navigate through every decision, big or small. You've been patient with us, helping us grow and learn from the mistakes we make. And like God, you forgive us, offering us grace so those mistakes can never define us. You've been present. It sounds so simple, but it's so important just knowing you're there when we need you. And most of all, you've loved us unconditionally as only someone filled with God's love could. So today we thank you, moms, for all of this and so much more. Happy Mother's Day. I want to say happy Mother's, to, uh, Mother's Day to all the new moms, all the adopted moms, all the spiritual moms, all the grandmoms, all the moms. I want to say happy Mother's Day to you. Literally, we wouldn't be here without you, so thank you. All right, so today I want to, ta- I want to finish my mini-series on the family. Last week we talked about a non-toxic form of masculinity. Basically biblical manhood so we talked about last week we talked how it is the role and the responsibility of the husband of the father to lead his home spiritually okay so god designed marriage with each person having a specific role and that's what we talked about last week and we're going to continue on this week so some of you guys might see this title feminine not feminist who the heck does he think he is putting that up there well i actually saw that title on an instagram uh, username and the lady's got some pretty cool stuff on there so i'm not here to attack women i'm not here to attack uh, the value of women i'm actually here to come to look at the value of women through scripture so with that being said where the title is called feminine not feminist being the woman god desires you to be So when you start to read the Bible, you don't have to get very far when you encounter the words such as woman, wife, and mother. It's actually the first couple chapters of Genesis. And the Bible always speaks highly of motherhood. It says that motherhood is a blessing, it's a calling, but it also says it's a huge responsibility. So last week we spoke about Adam and Eve, their marriage. We actually looked at three marriages last week for if you guys didn't catch it or if you weren't here. We looked at... The marriage of Adam and Eve we looked at the marriage of Jesus Christ and the church and then we also brought it to a practical level an application level we looked at our own marriages or we were supposed to look at our own marriages and see hey am I fulfilling the specific role that God has given to me as the husband and then now we're gonna look at the wives and the mothers I had somebody say get him Nate get the woman this week you got us last week so let's get the woman this week I'm not here to do that. I'm here just, you know, we're going to go through God's word and we're going to see what that has to say. So last week, again, Adam and Eve, Genesis 3, chapter 8, the last point of last week was what to do after failure. So I want to look back at the failure real quick and then we're going to move forward. We're going to slingshot out of here. So Genesis 3, 8 through 9. Now they heard the sound. This is after Adam and Eve took of the fruit and they disobeyed God. It says, now they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Then the Lord God called to the man and said to him, hey, Adam, where are you at? He said, or Adam said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I heard your footsteps. And I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. So God says, hey, who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? 
Then the man said, the woman. How many of us husbands say that? Oh, it's the wife. It's the wife. The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree, and I ate it. So God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And then so the woman says, hey, it was the serpent. You created the serpent. You created all things. The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So again, this takes place immediately after the couple sin. First, they try to make excuses, put the blame on the other person. Oh, how many times do we, as, I mean, we're going to get real today, okay? Can we get real? We're all married, or we're all alive. We all have problems. We all have, well, let's, let's look to the word for solutions, right? Some of us, if not all of us, at some point in our lives or another have asked God, hey, change my wife. God, change my husband. He's so, fill in the blank. Nobody's done that? I have. So they, even the first couple try to make excuses and put the blame on other people. But God wasn't having that. He, he sent a punishment. He said, you know what? I know it was you. I know it was you. And I know it was you. The other night, uh, something happened in my house. And I asked my three older kids. I said, hey, who did this? I didn't do it, Dad. I didn't do it. Oh, no, I didn't do it. That wasn't me. How am I supposed to know as a dad who did it? I don't know. So God, kind of the same way, I mean, he knows. God knows all things, right? But humor me here, okay? So God, he said, okay, the serpent, you're getting a curse. Adam, you're getting a curse. And Eve, you're getting a curse. So last week we looked at the man. We're going to look at the woman's curse today. Genesis 3, 16. To the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. Thank you, moms. In pain you shall deliver children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. So in, in Genesis 1, chapter 28, or Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, uh, God reveals that one of his purposes for marriage was for Adam and Eve to procreate. He said, be fruitful and multiply. So the curse increased the pain. And I want to look at what Adam, his response real quick to his wife's failure and the new conditions they had to live by. So verse 20. Now the man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. Even after she failed, we don't even really see her name yet. There, was, there wasn't a name. But then he, after the curse, it says... Now the man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all living. She was going to be the first mother. Through her, the human race would continue. So look at that. From the very beginning of motherhood, she failed. The very first mother made huge mistakes. Throughout scripture, we read about mothers and we read about God's love for women. Okay, in contrast with the times the Bible was written in, that culture was women are property. Not there's something to be cherished and loved, but we see God giving dignity, respect, honor, attention, and responsibility to the women. So if you have your Bibles, turn to Ephesians chapter 5. We're going to pick up verses 22 through 24. And point number one, husbands need their wives. Big shock, right? Wives, subject yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. So again, as much as the husbands need to fulfill their role in marriage... In the family that God designed for them, it's equally important that the wife fulfills hers. So the Apostle Paul tells us that wives are called to submit to their husbands, which means to voluntarily place themselves under submission, under the legitimate authority of their husband. It says, to your own husband, okay? Submit to your husband. That's what it says. So this sounds like a difficult command, but let's look at a couple things here. First, I want to make it clear. Women and men 
through the eyes of God are valued the same. They are no less than one another, okay? There is a distinction in the function, right? So yes, men and women are equal as far as value, but there is a different role that God created the man for and the woman for. Does that make sense? Okay, secondly, real quick, submission is not slavery or bondage. We hear the word be submissive and immediately we hear, oh, I'm inferior or I'm worth less. They're over me, right? No, women are not slaves one to men or their children, okay? Again, men and women are both viewed by God in the same light when it comes to value. So let me give you a brief example of the equality but submit submission. Let's look at Luke 22, 41 through 42. We're going to look at the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. So Jesus being equal with God in essence, so he's God the Son and then there's God the Father, right? God the Son is equal to the Father, but when it comes through function, God the Son submits to God the Father. He submits to his will. This is right before he's about to get crucified, Jesus says, or the, the scripture says, and he, Jesus, withdrew from them about a stone's throw, and he knelt down and began to pray, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. So God the Son is subject to the will of the Father, the direction of the Father, the leadership of the Father. That is a similar picture Submission, the wife to the husband. I hope you guys can follow me there. So we see that in the Garden of Gethsemane. He, he did submit himself to Christ, to, to God the Father. Wives, counterculture, we need to do the same for our husbands. Again, you too were created in God's image, but God designed the woman to play a different role than the husband. It's a significant role, actually. It's a voluntary, subordinate role in the life of her husband and the children. So the second thing we must keep in mind is the wife's submission is not absolute. Okay, it says, as to the Lord. I don't have that scripture up there, but we'll read it again real quick. But as the church, respect yourselves to your own husbands as to the Lord. Verse 22. So what does that mean? Again, last week we talked about how did Christ says we need to love the, uh, our husbands need to love wives as Christ loved the church. So we looked at, okay, what are some of the ways Christ loved the church? That way, that's our example for husbands to love their wives. So in what ways does the church submit to Christ when it says, but as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. Quickly, the church submits to Christ obediently. That word means it's a manner that shows willingness to comply. Again, as wives, again, marriage is not slavery, okay? But, and, and wives shouldn't be here, whatever you need, sir, whatever you need, you know? It's a union, right? But obediently, just like Christ, or the church submits to Christ, we, we do that obediently. God's word says, thou shalt not. It says, you need to do this. It's got commands. It's got things in our life or in here that we need to follow. We need to apply to our lives, right? And we as Christians need to do that obediently, a manner that shows willingness to comply. Same thing for wives. Willingly is of one's free will. It's not coerced. It's not the word I'm looking for. It's not out of malice or bitterness, right? Uh, the church submits to Christ confidently. It's a self-assured way that expresses faith in something. Because we trust God, we can trust him with our husbands. Well, I don't have a husband, but we, you can trust him with your husbands, right? Why? Because God's word says to, okay? And then actively the church submits actively we apply it to our lives we live it out daily actively means to deliberately and positively do it to be intentional and then completely the church submits to christ completely it just means totally everything god your word says it i'm gonna do it so real quick i know the, the proverbs 31 ver, uh, chapter is really cliche amongst churches today, but I want to look at that because God's word has something to say about a godly wife. Proverbs 31, 27. 
She watches over the activities of her household and does not eat the bread of idleness. So, again, countercultural. The diligent and hardworking woman is concerned for the well-being of her family. The wife that the husband needs takes care of the family's affairs. And she's so concerned with maintaining her own household, she's not partaking in the gossip of another's household. She's not trying to put herself in this business and that business. She's focused on her own family. That's what Proverbs 31, 27 is speaking about. The blessed wife is a good homemaker, countercultural. She is diligent in her day-to-day duties and considers managing her home a calling and a blessing. Wife, stay at home mom. Even if you're a working mom and you come home and do this, I just want to say what you do does not go unnoticed. Uh, it's very, very valuable. It's necessary. It's much needed and appreciated. Investopedia in 2019, you guys probably saw this fact, but they said that the stay-at-home wife's median salary in 2019, if you would account up everything that they do in the home, wash, you clean the house, take care, doing the child care, you know, if you uh, break it all down, you know what their salary is? should be? Huh? It's higher. $178,201 a year. I don't even know how much that is per month or hourly, but it's a lot. All right? So thank you, wives. So husbands, we, you know what? Husbands, let's give it up for our wives. Come on. You know what? The Bible says he who finds a wife finds a good thing. And truly, finding a wife that submits to Scripture is, a, is the best thing you single men can do, you married men. You know, set that example in your homes for your wives. Follow God's design, his structure, because you can live a blessed life. Point number two, children need their mothers. I don't think this will be a long sermon. I'm actually almost halfway done. So... Being a mother is from the Lord, okay? It's a gift from him. It's one of the ways that a woman can bring glory to God. It's one of the ways you can serve God by bringing up your child in the ways of the Lord. The Bible tells us in Proverbs 22, 6, that we are to train a child in the way he should go so that even when he grows older, he will not abandon it. All right, let's talk again real quick. I'm the youth pastor, right? So... Did you know that youth pastors only get your children 40 to 60 hours a year? Do you know that? It's one, a little over an hour a week. Did you know that schools get your kids about 1,200 hours a year? That's, that's a big significant or difference. Did you know, though, that you as a parent get your child about 3,000 hours a year? We need to wake up as moms and dads. We want to think, that we want to expect the church to do that, the school to teach our kids. We as Christian parents are our children's biggest influence, okay? What we model for, for our kids in the home is going to shape who they will become. So mothers together with the father are assigned a daunting task that cannot be done in our own strength, you guys. You ever try to operate in your own strength raising kids? Oh, man, I tell you, I, I feel for you guys. I've, I don't know. You know, they say that life is tough with Jesus. It's impossible without him. <laughs> you know, we actually have a, a kind of like a guideline, a way to help us out. We have hope. The world who doesn't have Christ has no hope. They don't have any direction. They're left to stumble around in the darkness trying to figure out how to raise children that are going to be functional members of society. So our daunting task set before us cannot be done on our own strength, okay? We as husbands and wives, we need to operate in God's design. Last week, husbands, if you didn't watch the sermon last week, it's on YouTube, go watch it for you husbands, okay? You're hearing it today as wives. We need to operate in God's design. Husband as the head, wife as the helper, both in submission to Christ. What does that mean? Husbands and wives, fathers and mothers, pray for your children. Pray for your marriage. Seek the Lord. 
set the example in your home. Train up a child in the way he should go, so that even when he grows older, he will not abandon it. What, what, what is the way that they should go? How do we train them up? What do we teach them? Teach them about the cross. Teach them out about sin. Teach them about the necessity of repentance. Teach them about the reality of hell. Do we do that? Teach them the importance of church attendance. Teach your, your young children as they start to grow up about purity. To avoid all the mess of broken relationships. Teach them, instruct them, raise them up in the ways of the Lord. Take them to church, but don't expect the church to be the one to fix your kids or to teach your kids. Because remember, we only get them 40 to 60 hours a week. We need to model moms and dads at home the characteristics of a godly man and a godly woman, a godly father and a godly mother. We need to also teach them that Christ is coming back one day. He's going to judge the earth. And remember, we talked last week, Christ is married to the church. He's coming for his bride very soon. And we're going to spend eternity with him. We're going to be rejoicing. We're going to be in paradise. The Bible says there will be no more tears. How many tears have you cried in your marriage because your spouse didn't fulfill your expectations? Or they're not walking according to the word of God. God's going to wipe away every tear. We're going to forget the hurts of this life. We need, how do we teach them this stuff? Again, the cross, the gospel, Jesus Christ, all these Christian buzzwords, right? We need to do this through our good conduct, through our speech, how we talk to each other, our attitude, our mindset, how we interact with each other. So typically it's the mother who is home more with the kids, is it not? Just quick poll, how many of you mothers are home more with your kids than the fathers? It's, you know, pretty standard, most of you guys, okay. So it's the mother who's home more with the kids, thus giving them the greater influence in their child's life. Not always, but sometimes. How do I know? You ever watch a sports game, like a football, like Super Bowl, and somebody just did a, a cool touchdown or something? Is that the right word for football? Touchdown? I don't know. Huh? <laughs> But then the camera zooms up on them, and they're like, yeah, I just want to thank my mama. Well, how come you didn't thank your dad? Your dad's probably the one who taught you how to tackle, how to block. <laughs> Why? Because the love of the mother will impact the child, not only in the present, but the, in the future. The mother holds the heart of the child. The example, mother, is greater than you know. So Proverbs 31 says, She opens her mouth in wisdom, and the teaching of kindness is on her tongue. A godly mother is wise. Mothers are extremely important. She imparts wisdom. She illustrates kindness. Through the words you speak, Mom, you're instructing your children how to live. Through your nurturing care and your gentle spirit that God specifically designed women to have, you make your child feel safe and comforted. According to Proverbs 31, the mother who embodies wisdom and kindness will be praised by her children. Motherhood has a way of teaching us, actually parenthood, I mean, I don't want to disinclude fathers here, but motherhood and fatherhood has a way of teaching us the grace and mercy of God the Father. It also teaches us the love and the patience that God has for us, right? Your kids might test your patience. This last week, I don't know, all of a sudden, I've been trying to put my kids to sleep and they come out four or five times. I'm like, bro, you were asleep. How are you up? They do to, all, you know, test your patience. At the end of the day, I'm just like, oh, I just want to sleep. I just want to rest. I just want to spend time with my wife. Then, oh, shoot, there's Ezra. <laughs> there's Oliver. I know Kara's the perfect child. She's sleeping in her bed, you know. <laughs> but I hear those boys stomping. I'm waiting for my three-month-old to grow some legs and walk around, <laughs> you know. So your kids might test your patience. Your teenager might scream at you. 
saying, I hate you. How about this? Your adult child might have walked away from the faith and turned their back on God. You might be broken, heartbroken about your kids' actions and decisions. Our children's failures show us our own sin in rel uh, relativity or in relation to God. How many times does the scripture tell us to do something and we're like, nah, I'm going to do my own thing. Adam and Eve did it, right? God said not to do something and they did it. Our kids do the same. So parenthood teaches us about the love that God, fa God the Father has for us. Let me ask you a question. When your child fails, does your love change for your child? Oh, you know what? He didn't obey me today, so I don't really love him that much today. No, it doesn't. It's the same thing with God. When we make mistakes, when we sin. Again, it teaches us how much God loved us. And we can emulate that to our children. We must remember to look to God for our strength, you guys. It's, we cannot do this on our own. Children need their mothers to actively pray for them. If you have young children, pray for their purity. Pray for their future spouse. Pray for their life choices. If you have teenagers, pray that God would protect them from the insanity that's being taught in the schools today. Pray that God would protect them from the things that they encounter with their friends on social media, when they see on TV, or at their schools. God forbid even what they see in the home. Children need their moms to teach them moral character and modesty. So when your child becomes an adult and moves out, your work is not done, mother. How many of you guys know that? How many of you have adult children here? Your work's not done, right? It's never over. Scripture teaches us that the older women and those that have adult children are just as important as the new mom, the new wife. I love how the kingdom of God has a place for everyone and gives everyone a purpose. Point number three, the church needs its women. Titus 2, 3 through 5, older women likewise are to be reverent in their behavior, not malicious gossips, nor enslaved to much wine, teaching what is good so that they may encourage the young women to love their husbands, to love their children, to be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Real quick. This is not the author's opinion. Paul. Paul wrote this, okay? He wasn't some, what's the word, misogynistic, chauvinistic, one of those istic words. He's not some guy that has a vendetta against women and wants to suppress women, actually. He wants to show them their value. But the word of God is fully inspired it's inerrant can we agree with that that there's no errors in this in this book amen that means it's infallible that means it cannot fail this is god's plan for women god's design older women in the church among god's people should model christian virtues to the younger women in the congregation you know crosswinds is growing how many babies do we have in the nursery right now we have a ton Right? We got a lot of kids in children's church. Amen. Praise God. He's bringing families. Amen. He's doing something in the earth today. He's pouring out his spirit. He's convicting husbands and wives, fathers and mothers. Hey, I need to get my family to church. This world is insane. Thank you, new families that are here, families that have been here forever, families that are watching online. Thank you for being willing to hear the word of God. In our nursery... This is a way that women can get involved. We need more volunteers. We need that gentle, quiet spirit to pick up that crying baby and put it to sleep. And to show it love, him or her love, right? That's a way that you can serve God through nursery, through children's church. That's a way that you can set, you can put to use. Let me back up a second. I'm a business owner. I'm 29, I've been doing construction a long time, but I hire people that are much more experienced in different trades, so that way, I, and I let them tell me, even though I'm the boss, I'm the owner, 
how they're going to do it. You know why? Because I'm tapping into their experience, their knowledge, their wisdom, their advice. That's what we as the older women here in the church, we need you. You guys have so much experience raising kids, grandkids, going through adoptions or deaths. You know, there's, life is hard, and you guys have been through it all, one person or another. We need to tap into that experience here at the church. So how can we close the generational gap and in, and from the older women to the younger women? This is just my idea, my, my suggestion. Invite, invite, if you're in this category of the older women who have adult children, you don't have to be 100 years old. You, can, you know, Maybe you've been married 15 years and you're only 35. I don't know. You know maybe you have semi-grown kids. Invite one of the younger moms over, the newer wives over. Teach them things that you have found to be beneficial to your own family. Impart wisdom to them. Where else, may I ask, will a young Christian wife find godly women to come alongside her, to disciple her, to live faithfully to her husband, faithful to the word of God, and to build up her family? It sure is in Hollywood. It's not social media. It's nowhere to be found except here in the church. Again, Hollywood, movies, books, media. All these things discourage the family unit. In fact, they endorse and praise everything contrary to the word of God. According to the Apostle Paul, a young wife, a young mother should be able to find plenty of examples of what it means to submit to their husbands as is fitting to the Lord inside the church. A young wife needs to be taught that if she aligns her life with the principles laid out in this book, what it means to be a godly wife, a godly mother, she will not only experience God's blessing, but she will also, the Bible says, prevent God's word from being slandered or dishonored. Next slide. Be sensible, pure, workers at home, kind, being subject to their own husbands so that the word of God will not be dishonored. Can I just make a statement here? I'm going to say it. Following God's design is not a way to put women down. It's not a way to suppress them. In fact, it's a way to build them up. It's not a terrible thing to be submissive, you guys. You, you lit girls, actually. Uh, living by God's design was never meant to be humiliating, degrading, contrary to what culture says. Remember when I said last week how Satan twisted God's word when he was in the garden? With Eve, after he, and he deceived her, saying that the fruit was, in fact, good to eat. She believed him and suffered the consequences. This is something that Satan is still doing today. He's still taking God's word, twisting it, spewing it out of his filthy, disgusting mouth, and into the ears of the people in our society, through television, through social media, all these avenues, through literature, the arts. And virtually anything, any way he can, he can manipulate someone, he can change the words of Scripture, just minute so it changes what the Word of God says. He's going to try to put himself, remember I said last week he's a snake, he slithers through the cracks. That's what he's going to try to do in your life, in your marriage, in your motherhood. We've seen, here's an example, we've seen for the several decades now the emergence of the fem feminist movement, the women empowerment movement. Again, they push for equality with man, saying, hey, I could do what a man can do. But remember, God does see women, or they say, the feminist movement, I'm equal to man. Remember, God does see the women and men equal in essence, but difference in function. And that is nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with that. Just because the wife is in submission to her husband does not mean she's any less important. Did you catch the lie? The feminist movement, the deception. Hey, women can be like men. You don't have to follow God's word. You can do whatever you want to do. Then they want to try and say that men can get pregnant. I hope I can't get pregnant. I really do. In pain, you're going to have increased childbirth, right? 
Nope, I'm, I'm so thankful that men cannot give birth, okay? That's the lie, though. It's so backwards. It's so, oh, man. How can you, it's so crazy. How can you even believe that? Because the enemy is good at what he does. If you are not in the word of God, guess what? You're going to be deceived. How can you distinguish the truth from a lie? If I told you three statements here today, two of them were truths and one was a lie, you wouldn't really know unless you, which one is a lie or truth, unless it was something blatantly obvious. But you would have to know me, right, to understand whether or not what I'm saying is true. You would have to know me. You have to know the word of God. So again, being a submissive wife is not to put you down. It's not because you're weak. In fact, I would venture to say that submitting to God's word, following God's design, will make you the most powerful woman uh, uh, version of yourself as a woman possible. Because you're not doing it through your own strength, which we are weak, but we're doing it through his, his word, his strength. So the Bible says that the, woman, the godly woman possesses these qualities. She's sensible. She takes care of her home. She is kind. And most of all, she is submissive to the God-given authority of her husband. All right, I'm going to close here. The Bible speaks that being a mother is looked at as nothing less than noble, and it is a high calling. So sometimes moms, when the laundry's piled up, the dishes are overflowing on the sink, they're on the counters, the kids are fighting with each other. You may feel that you're a failure or that you're going to overwhelmed or like you want to give up. Then you ask yourself, hey, is it even worth it? Sometimes when you've been through a rough patch, the devil likes to slither in and he says, you know what? Those kids, your husband will be better off without you. You're such a failure that they would be so much better without you in their lives. You should just go. You should leave. The Bible says what God has joined together, let nobody separate. Don't listen to that lie. Don't listen to that deception. Mothers, wives, husbands need their wives, children need their moms, and church needs their women. We need you guys to be, you ladies, to be godly influences in every facet of our lives. So I want to say to the mom out there that feels like they're failing or have failed, I want you to look at Eve. Again, she messed up completely. She brought death to all her descendants, brought a curse. You guys are in pain in childbirth because of Eve, right? The first mother. The God of the universe gave her a second chance when she sinned. He, sac he made that sacrifice. We talked about that last week. He clothed her and said, you're going to be the mother of all living things. If you if you failed, look to the cross. If you feel like you're failing, look to the cross. If you're succeeding, look to the cross. In everything, look to the cross. Again, I have four kids. I know how tough it can be, how overwhelming. I'm not speaking from a place of uh, naivety. What is that word? I'm not naive about it, okay? I can't talk this morning for some reason. I'm not here to be naive. Oh, if you just read the Bible, everything's going to be perfect. No, you know, it takes work. It does. It takes submission. It takes adherence to the word of God, right? But mom, don't beat yourself up over it. Again, it's, being a parent shows us our sin. Go to the cross. Repent. Turn from it. If you, if you uh, did something to your kids, go and apologize. If you, said, if you did something to your husband, lay down your pride and say, look, husband, I'm sorry. I was going through this or that. Can you forgive me? Let's move forward in unity. Let's, let's look to God. Let's look to the Christ. Let's study his word. Husband, while you're, while you're being obedient to your position, your role that God has designed you to play, wife, I am going to be doing the same. I am going to submit to you as to the Lord. I want to tell you, last thing, this thing works, okay? Ask me how I know. This, oh, thank you. I'll, I'll tell you right now. All right. So this thing works. I got a, a couple more minutes. Just growing up, I had a really hard time writing this sermon this week. I think I wrote like three or four sermons, and I tossed them out like, oh, no, that's not good. You know? I did not know how to write about a godly mom or a godly wife. I, I didn't. But the good thing is it forced me 
to look through the scriptures. Growing up, my mom, uh, she went to prison for a long, a big portion of my childhood. I think I was four, three or four years old. So I had a stepmom. My dad and my stepmom took me to church. At home, they were different. Some of the things, they did their best to try to emulate what the Word of God says. They gave me a lot of things. They taught me a lot of ways not to be a dad, not to be a mom, not to be a husband or wife, not to do this to your children. You know, I remember being in so much anguish, just crying out for my mom. I'm a little four-year-old. Mom, where are you? I haven't seen you. Guess what? I got to see her in jail shackled to a, ch a, a table. I used to hate Mother's Day, but this thing works. I prayed every day for my mom. I went to the cross, and she's here today. She's in her right mind. She's saved. She's serving God. We have a great relationship because that's the power of the Holy Spirit working through somebody. Don't tell me that this doesn't work. Don't tell me that God is not real. Just because you want to follow society and say, oh, I, can, I have this complex, I'm a woman. Yes, God made you amazing. He did. I am so thankful for women. God, again, contrary to culture, what culture has said, God has always, always, always given dignity to the woman, given responsibility giving a purpose. Let's operate in that purpose, you guys. The gospel works. Jesus saves. The, way, the reason we operate as a church is to see souls saved, lives transformed, families changed, but not on our, just behavior modification. It's not about behavior modification. Do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. How do you renew your mind? It's not through some program. It's not through some friendship. It's through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Takeaways real quick and I'm done. The Bible says, motherhood is a blessing, Psalms 127.3. Children are a heritage from the Lord. Yeah, worship team, you could come up. Offspring are a reward from, him, from God. Next one. Motherhood is full of joy. May your father, our Proverbs 23, 25, may your father and mother rejoice. May she who gave you birth be joyful. Last one. Motherhood is a calling. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praises her. Amen. He who finds a wife finds a good thing. Husbands, remember your role as a husband and father is to be the head of your home, submitted to Christ, leading your family. Wife, your role is to be submitted to your husband as he follows Christ. Raise your children, set that example, and you'll see God move in your marriage, in your family, in your future. God bless you. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Nate.